What's up guys, welcome to a tech video that I never actually thought I would be making, talking about mostly what Apple added to the newest iPad and the older iPads with iPad OS 13.4, but also some general things that have changed and the newest iPad Pro. So let's get started. So since most of this video is gonna just be me talking about the cursor support on the new iPad OS, which is something that can run on pretty much every iPad, I'm gonna talk first about the new iPad Pro and the accessories that came out, and then we'll move on to cursor support. So the new iPad came out, and it's an iPad Pro that looks almost identical to the current iPad Pro, the 2018 iPad Pro, but we have a lot of under the hood changes and a big change around back. And also they updated the screen, so it's 600 nits of brightness instead of the previous 500, so that's also cool. But under the hood, they've essentially bumped up your minimum storage to 128 gigabytes, thank God, because 64 gigabytes was just not even close to adequate for a $1,000 tablet or an $800 tablet, like seriously. So they start out with 128 gigs, which pretty much means that the 11 inch iPad and the 12.9 inch iPad Pro series is basically cannibalizing the iPad Air at this point, but who cares because it's an iPad and at this point with what they've added, who needs a MacBook Air anymore? <laughs> but yeah, so the new 120 gigabyte storage minimum is a welcome addition to the iPad series. And the only other thing that changed under the hood is the A12Z processor, which as far as I can tell is just an improvement on the graphical side of things because the A12X was already an incredibly powerful processor. In fact, the A12X being on an iPad from 2018 is still outperforming entry model MacBook Pros, mid-range MacBook Airs, and a ton of entry to mid-range model PCs. So that just really goes to show that A, Intel needs to step up their game, B, AMD is stepping up their game, but they really need to step it up in the mobile department, and C, good God, Apple is kicking ass with their silicon game, and there really wasn't much further to go with the X series other than improving graphics and changing it from X to Z. I don't know why they didn't call it Y, but whatever. But yeah, those are really the only things that I saw that changed with the iPad. It's kind of bizarre. I would have expected more, but internally, I guess if you're already kicking ass with a two year old system, you might as well just keep the ball rolling with what you have and maybe improve a little bit. And that's exactly what they did. Now around back is where we see the biggest change that you can physically see, which is the camera system. And from all the leaks that I was following, it looks like they were gonna be doing a triple camera system. You're gonna have the same as the 11 Pro Max where you're gonna have your ultra wide, wide and zoom lens. But we actually only got a wide and ultra wide. They forego the zoom lens for the option of a LiDAR sensor. And why the hell would they add a LiDAR sensor? Well, they added it because quite frankly, running a full AR system on a tablet that big while just using a single camera was not really yielding the best results. I mean, take a look at this picture that I took of the new iPad Pro in AR, and it didn't even track it to the desk properly, it's floating. So the idea with the LiDAR sensor is it's basically like a high powered version of of what they're doing with Face ID, the sort of high density dot projection mapping that's going to give you this really accurate simulation and readout of the room so that it can track things directly to whatever you're pointing the camera at. And that is so much more data because now you have an ultra wide, you're viewing it through the wide, and the LiDAR sensor is giving you this full readout of everything around it. So for a while now, the iPhones have had a better AR system because of the fact that they're pulling data from three cameras and the iPads have kind of suffered because they've only ever had one camera. And personally, I've only ever used that camera for, well, document scanning, which is actually a really good feature, don't knock it, but I've never used it for video or photography. And then whenever I really wanted to play with anything AR-based, I would just pull out my iPhone. But now that they have a LiDAR sensor, the iPad can potentially be the best AR system. And I think that once we see it integrated into something like glasses, I think AR is gonna become a big player. In fact, make sure to subscribe if you guys are interested in this content because I am making a video that will be coming out next week about augmented reality and the potential that it can have on day-to-day -day life. I've been putting a whole lot of work into it, so make sure to subscribe. This is a little clip of kind of one of the ideas that I was having with it, so make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your activity feed because I really wanna see what you guys think about my ideas. But yeah, so LiDAR on the iPad should be a pretty big game changer for augmented reality. I think it's the next sort of big step to improving it now that it's gonna be more accurate. So cool, we've got an improved camera system and a slightly brighter screen and a slightly faster processor for graphics and yay. Same price, that's nice, but um, 
oh well, it looks exactly the same as the as the current 2018 iPad Pro. What What's the deal? Well, the deal is the fact that the accessories that came out will now work with both the newest one and the 2018 models, which makes me super excited because obviously I can't go dropping 800 to to $1,000 right out of the gate for an iPad Pro, but what I can do is go and drop $300 in May for the case and basically just do a review of that first. And why is this case such a big deal? Well, here's the reason why the case is such a big deal. It added so many things. Number one, before we get to the cursor support, I'm chomping at the bit to talk about cursor support, but here's what they added apart from a glorious trackpad and cursor support in iPad OS. I almost forgot to say iPad OS. Here's what else they added. The keyboard is finally backlit. That has been one of the biggest reasons for me to not recommend the iPad Pro case that I use currently. I bought it thinking that it was going to be a perfectly fine keyboard case, but it just isn't. I'm sorry. Like Apple has done so much better with their folding keyboard cases in the past. I mean, we had the weird iPad first gen keyboard case that was sort of not a case. It was just a keyboard stand. That was weird, but we've seen improvements on and on since the first Pro came out. And I was sort of expecting that again, but when this older iPad Pro case came out, it was just a letdown. The keys were mushy, but kind of clicky. I got used to it. I don't really care anymore. I can type on it like any other keyboard because you adapt, you get used to it, and that's exactly what I did. But there's no backlight. It's not really the tallest key travel. It's not the best case. There's just a lot of sacrifices with it. And they're charging 180 bucks for the 12 or for the 11 inch and 200 bucks for the 12.9 inch. It's just stupid. So the new one is still expensive. <laughs> it's $300 for the 11 inch and $350 for the 12.9 inch, but backlit keyboard, scissor switch keyboard mechanism, which I can only assume means that it's gonna feel about as good as the new Magic Keyboard system on the newly introduced Air, the 16 inch MacBook Pro, and the Magic Keyboard that I've been using for years now. I mean, one can hope. It's a floating cantilever design, which the name alone makes me think that Johnny Ives was still involved somehow, but it hovers the iPad just above the keyboard. It's fully adjustable, so you can actually adjust it to any angle you want instead of two rigid design clip angles, thank God. It's got a pass-through USB. Now, I'm not sure if that USB charges both the iPad and has to charge the keyboard case. I don't know if the keyboard case is powered off the iPad like the other ones are. It's kind of gonna be a bummer if it isn't because if it's battery operated, that'll kind of suck because the whole magic of the keyboard was the fact that there was no battery. You just hook it up and the iPad just hooks up and rolls and it powers it and everything. So hopefully it's powered through the iPad. If it isn't, that'll be a bit of a letdown, but whatever. But it's got a power pass through, which means you can plug your iPad into power and use it on power while charging it. It's gonna keep charged and leave the USB port on the side of the iPad Pro on the other side for things like USB devices like, I don't know, a USB thumbstick now that you can do it. I mean, that is so awesome. Because ever since they added the USB thumb drive support, the only thing that I felt was really hindering the iPad was the fact that you only have one USB-C port. So you either have to dongle it out or just not charge the iPad during a heavy task if you're gonna be transferring files. But now that you can charge it and you have a USB open, that's freaking awesome. And now I have waited long enough I have eaten my meat, can I have my pudding? If anybody gets that reference, let me know in the comments. I can finally talk about the trackpad slash cursor support, because when I saw trackpad support, my first thought was, okay, only trackpads. And I immediately paired up my Magic trackpad to the iPad, and it works perfectly, but it's not quite like a mouse and keyboard setup. So let me explain. So obviously with most cursors, it's very rigid. It's, you know, move here, boom, it's there. Move over here, boom, it's there. The iPad has this sort of floating feel to the movement of the cursor, and it doesn't look like a mouse. It's a dot, it's rounded like the, like the end of your finger. And after watching the video of my favorite Apple employee, Craig Federighi, explaining why they did it that way, it actually makes a lot of sense. The whole point of cursor support is not to encourage you to not touch the screen, Microsoft. The whole reason why they're doing it this way is because it is still a touch first operating system. The difference though, is that just like on Mac OS, how gestures are an integral part of your use in the system, gestures are even more necessary on the iPad, both with touching the screen and using a mouse. The problem that I've always had with Microsoft's operating system is the fact that it was made sort of cursor use case first, and then they kind of shoehorned in touchscreen support. 
And you can tell this in a lot of ways, especially in the sense that when you go to actually separate a keyboard from it or flip it into tablet mode or whatever the case may be for getting it to tablet mode, it's an entirely different interface. It switches to the Metro Tile UI. And then when you use it with the mouse and keyboard, it's only going to be in your standard Windows layout. This separation is sort of jarring if you've never used a Microsoft product before or if you've never tried to use one with touch, it's just sort of jarring. And on top of that, a lot of programs are just cursor support only. So when you open them up in touchscreen mode, nothing changes from their cursor mode to their touchscreen mode. It just looks like a cursor version of a touchscreen or a touchscreen version of a cursor operating system. I don't know. It's really weird. It basically just goes full screen, but all the buttons are still super tiny. So you have to use a mouse. This is different because the dot sort of snaps to things that are generally smaller than what you'd expect for a mouse, which I almost thought you wouldn't need because your finger is more precise. So if you can tap those smaller touch points with your finger, why would you need it to sort of snap to it? But it makes so much sense because it doesn't grip it super hard it just kind of floats and over it. And then when you move to a different one, it snaps to that one, but it doesn't take a lot of effort to move the cursor between those items. Gestures are still there and they are very similar to what you'd expect on a Mac, but kind of repurposed. So some of the ones that stayed the same are things like two finger scrolling works exactly the way you'd expect it to on a Mac, but three fingers and going up sort of isn't the same, but kind of is, it's, it's weird. So they repurposed it to take you straight home if you just swipe up, or if you swipe up and hold, it goes into multitasking. Very similar to how when you do that with Mac, those three fingers swiped up will actually take you into, this is gonna show how long I've been using a Mac, it's not called Expose anymore, what is it called? Mission Control. It takes you into Mission Control on a Mac, or what us old Mac users used to call Expose. So it's just a different use case for the same gestures. You can also use that swiping gesture to switch between apps when they're open, which is awesome. And things that are based off of different locations on the screen, like clicking the home bar or pulling up control center or pulling down notification center are a click away instead of a swipe away. So they didn't force you to have to kind of drag it. So if you guys ever played around with the accessibility cursor that they had for a little while on iPad OS, it was basically just like using a touch screen, but with a clicker, it was so stupid and I hated it. But this one, everything's integrated really well. And my favorite part, it's not just trackpads. It supports mice as well. Mice, mouses, mice, mouse. It supports mice and it supports any generic USB cursor input. Do you know how I know that? I plugged in a 1998 green hockey puck mouse from an iMac from 1998. And you know what? It worked perfectly, which means that they just literally just said, here's full cursor support for anything that identifies as an input device. And I love it. And here's what I'm gonna do, just to try out the new cursor support and see if it makes my life any easier because they're advertising this whole iPad setup with the keyboard, the mouse, the newest iPad. They're talking about how it is not going to be a computer, but it's gonna replace your computer. I'm going to hook up my trackpad and edit my entire update video that I just recorded a couple minutes ago on my iPad and then post it to YouTube using my iPad exclusively and we'll see how that goes. So let's do that. Six hours later. All right, so one editing session, a mile run, a shower, a shirt change and some other stuff later, we're back. And uh, so yeah, that was a very interesting and not exactly what I expected experience when editing on that iPad again. So first off, if you all watched that update video, the bitrate was really weird because that program, whatever it does when it compresses 4K, I didn't realize that compressing it as low as I did would make it look that way. So it's not actually a processing or uploading error. It's actually an issue with the way that it compressed it down. I probably should have picked the higher bitrate, but it was way bigger than what it normally is for something like this. So I was kind of confused, but whatever, mistakes were made. <laughs> but the actual editing process was kind of weird. And this, this kind of opened my eyes to something that I didn't think about which is the fact that, and no, I didn't edit on the little hockey puck mouse, I actually used the trackpad. But now that there's cursor support, certain apps that aren't Apple apps are going to have to be updated to take advantage of this. Because one of the things that I love with Final Cut is that I can scroll wherever I want on the timeline while the video is playing and the playhead sticks to the timeline. I don't have to worry about like where the playhead is. Whereas with the program that they use or the program that I use personally on the iPad, which is uh, LumaFusion, the playhead is always in one place and your sort of movement across the timeline depends on where you move the bar back and forth. And so like your playhead stays in one place, you move the bar around, that's how that works. So it's weird when the editing process is close enough to what I'm used to on my MacBook that I go to edit it like it's my MacBook 
and realize that there are things that just aren't really well optimized. And plus the other thing is there's a lot of icons in Apple apps where the cursor sticks to them. These other programs don't have that, and that's gonna to have to be something that's added later. So it took a bit of getting used to, and to be quite honest, it literally felt no different than editing on my MacBook, apart from the things that I mentioned earlier about the learning curve. But LumaFusion was good enough as is that it really didn't feel any different editing on it with my finger either. I was actually more used to it that way, so kind of being used to it that way and knowing that I was gonna to have to tap on certain things to go certain places places already just meant that I was doing that same thing just now my finger was a mouse not a not a track or not a not, not my finger now one thing that I took a little longer to get used to and I still don't think I'm really used to it is there's this inertial movement that the cursor has it's just really weird so when you move the cursor around a lot and then you let go it sort of like moves almost like it's on an air hockey table it kind of has a little bit of like a remaining motion and I turned it off in the settings because you can do that and it made no difference in terms of ease like I actually prefer the inertial scrolling or the inertial movement once I got used to it, just because at least, even though I'm not 100% used to it, at least it felt a little more natural on an iPad because everything's very fluid on an iPad, whereas a computer, you expect things to be very like, stick to one place, move to one place. Like it's, it's I'm used to it that way. But yeah, it was just kind of weird because when you turned it off, it felt too sticky. And when you turned it on, it just took some getting used to because it was just not what I was, what I was used to. Otherwise though, I think doing that editing definitely gave me sort of an eye opener, which was the fact that while the cursor support is there and a lot of apps can now take advantage of it, there's still a lot of apps that sure they'll use it and you can, you can run an app and use the cursor, but things like the icons sticking to the cursor, or the cursor sticking to the icons and changing shape when they're selected and that kind of stuff, those things aren't in most of the apps yet. So that's gonna to have to be added in order to fully take advantage of that. Plus Apple, if you're gonna support a mouse without a scroll wheel, like the hockey puck mouse from 1998, you may, I don't know, wanna detect that and leave the scroll bar available on the side like it's 1998. That's nitpicking at that point. I don't think they're actually gonna do that because they're expecting most people to spend the $300 or $350 on the, on the trackpad accessory, so whatever. Either way though, that's been my experience with it. I'm definitely excited for the new iPads. I'm definitely excited for the new keyboard accessory. But most of all, that trackpad support, once you sort of get used to it and once apps start to catch up, I think that was sort of the final nail in the coffin that Apple needed to put in the coffin of Chromebooks to sort of show that they have sort of the dominant strategy when it comes to basic post PC computing especially in education. And I think that's where this is really gonna take off. Because think about it, you've got Logitech making third-party cases for the base model and entry model cheaper iPads, but they also support cursors. I see quite an overtake that Apple might have in the education market with this. But that's been it, let me know your thoughts. I'm definitely excited to try out the accessories when they become available. I'm definitely excited to try out the new iPad when it becomes available just because AR kit is just the coolest thing to me. And I'm really, really hoping that it's going to sort of become what I think it'll become, but we'll see. Anyway guys, thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe if you wanna see more videos like this. And apart from that, I'll see you in the next video. Make sure to be there and have a good one. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm pushing my luck with this one because not many people watch these videos anyway, but hey, I just wanna throw the fact that I'm you know, still making shirts. I think you guys should definitely check them out. I like the shirt designs. I'm actually gonna be making some more soon with the whole gaming thing in mind. And I'm also gonna be doing some stuff for the tech review videos and make it a shirt for that. But right now I still got the really cool designs for anime and you guys should check them out because if I'm gonna be making these Apple videos, you know it's gonna cost me something. So y'all should go check out the shirts, please.